So my name is Jacqueline. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Alberta in the Department of Computer Science. Um, and the research that I'm doing sort of focuses on how we can use machine learning in psychiatry. Um, <laughs> so actually up until about September when I went back to school, I'd been working here in Calgary, at the University of Calgary, in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, and I had a really great experience to sort of see what clinical practice in psychiatry looks like and sort of what are the research questions um, that we look at. And like a lot of other medical disciplines, the questions that we're asking in psychiatry are usually sort of focused on how do people with psychiatric conditions differ from those who don't? Or what's different about them? What's sort of the cause of these diseases? Um, and more and more, we're sort of finding that these are really challenging questions to ask. Um, more and more, we're finding that the body is sort of a complex system, so it's difficult to localize disease. Um, we're also finding that there's just a huge amount of variability in our population. And these sorts of things have really stopped us from making a lot of progress when it comes to clinical care and psychiatry. So we're diagnosing and planning treatments for our patients the same way that we've been doing for years. Um, so what that generally looks like, if somebody comes into the clinic sort of dealing with a psychiatric disorder, what will happen is they'll have sort of a structured clinical interview with their doctor um, and based on sort of the behavioral symptomology that they're able to recall, um, the doctor will make a decision as to what the diagnosis would be and what they feel that the best course of treatment for that individual would be. So unlike a lot of other medical disciplines, uh, there are no tools for doctors in psychiatry. There are no blood tests or neuroimaging scans you can do, um, which is a problem. So what we're trying to do is sort of flip the questions that we're asking. Um, so can we use machine learning to change the kinds of questions we're asking and start thinking about, okay, what works in clinical practice? Based on the patients that we've already seen, can we learn how to deal with ones in the future? Um, so you guys have probably all seen this, but this is sort of just the general layout of how machine learning works uh, when it comes to medicine. Uh, so usually what we're working with is sort of a table of data. So the rows in our tables would represent patients or samples that we've seen. Um, and then the columns would be our different features. So this is machine learning jargon a little bit, but for those of you guys that don't know, features would just be sort of characteristics or information that we know about our patients. Um, so in medicine, a lot of the time, the type of information we might want to use would be like basic demographic data about our patients. So one column could be something like the age, or another column could be the gender. Um, you might also want to include um, all kinds of genomic information or proteomic information about your patients, results from blood tests, really anything that you feel would be um, important to the problem that you're trying to address. Um, and then for each patient, we have the labels. So the labels are really what you want to know about your patient, that piece of information that's really interesting to you. Um, when it comes to medicine and psychiatry, this could be something like a diagnostic label. So does somebody have depression or not? Um, you could look at if you're working in cancer, this might be is a tumor, um, uh, is it benign or malignant? So these are the things you want to know about your patients. And the idea with machine learning is what we hope to do is train that machine learning model that will map from our features, those things that we know about our patients, to the labels, which we want to know. And once we train this model, the hope is when a new patient walks through the, walks through the door, we can collect these features, those information about our patients, um, to make a prediction about what that label would be. And I just want to motivate this um, talking a little bit about depression. Um, People have probably heard a lot about it recently. It's pretty popular um, in the media these days, but it's because it's such a prevalent issue. Um, it's estimated that approximately one in 10 Canadians will experience at least one episode of major depression in their lifetime. Um, and it's also the, the leading cause of disability worldwide. Um, and a lot of this is because, one, it's so prevalent. Um, and the other issue is um, a lot of young people are getting diagnosed or suffering from depression. So people in their teens and early 20s uh, start seeing the signs, and then they will deal with this for the rest of their lives. It's also a major cause of mortality. So more than one million suicides will occur per year worldwide. Sort of what might be surprising for people is that this isn't sort of the result of not having effective treatments for depression. There are actually a lot of effective treatments that do exist. Um, so we have different sort of pharmacotherapies, medications you can take, things like SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, different types of psychotherapy, so talking with um, a psychiatrist, so things like cognitive behavioral therapy. There's also different types of neural stimulation that exist, like repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. But 
the problem isn't that we don't have treatments, it's that we don't know which treatment are gonna work for our patients. So just like how depression can look a lot different from one person to the next, the treatment that's gonna be effective for somebody can look a lot different also. If we talk just a little bit sort of about the pharmacolo <laughs> pharmacology, um, there are studies saying that only about a third of patients are gonna respond to the first antidepressant that they take. And then on top of that, it will take about six to eight weeks before we even know if that medication is gonna be effective for them. So we have people that are dealing with severe mental illness that are now facing a potentially long and frustrating road to finding a treatment that's gonna work for them. And this will have huge implications on their personal life, so how they're dealing with their family, their friends, their partners, and also their ability to work. So what we can do with machine learning um, is sort of use these different treatments as our labels. So the idea here would be um, that we could have patients, um, and when they come into the office, before we start treating them, we collect a bunch of information about them, the features that we want to know. So we can do blood tests, neuroimaging scans, whatever we want to get information about them. Then we follow them and see what treatment is going to work for them, and those will end up being the labels. So what medication worked best for them? Maybe psychotherapy was a good choice, or the neurostimulation. We can then take that sort of information and train our machine learning model. So now we have a model that can map from the features, the information we know, to what treatment is gonna be the most effective. So when that new patient walks through the door and we don't know what treatment is gonna work for them, we can use that model we've already trained to make a prediction about what their best treatment option would be. And this is um, sort of the goal of the study that I've been working with for a number of years now called CAMBIND, which is the Canadian Biomarker Integration Network in Depression. Uh, we've been operating for a number of years um, out of Calgary and out of a number of sites across Canada collecting information like brain scans, clinical assessments, and blood tests so that we can figure out these models to figure out what would be the best option of treatment for people. Just the idea that it's taking way too long for us to treat depression. So out of these uh, modalities and platforms that we've been working with, the one that I'm actually most interested in is neuroimaging. So these images that we're able to capture of the brain from an MRI. Um, and the reason it's so interesting is you actually get sort of a snapshot of the brain. And MRIs are great because you're actually able to probe different properties of the brain. So we have structural images which allow us to just sort of look at the anatomy of the brain. What are the sizes of different structures or shapes? Um, we also have a type of imaging called functional imaging or fMRI, so we're able to take sort of a time series of images. Every two seconds we take a picture of your brain and we can see how the brain functions during different tasks, what regions are speaking to each other. Um, and we also have another type of structural imaging called diffusion tensor imaging, which allows us to visualize the actual white matter tracks in your brain. So we can see what regions of the brain are actually physically connected to each other. So we're able to catch a lot of information about the brain from these images, um, which of course the brain is hopefully the center of psychiatric disease. So going back to sort of the model that I showed you guys, um, we're usually with, working with patients and features. So how do we use neuroimages in this sort of framework? We need to extract some sort of features from them. Well, if you know anything about images, um, they're usually created from a set of voxels or pixels, and each one of them has a grayscale value. So sort of the intuitive thought would probably be, and an approach that's used in sort of uh, machine learning is, you could just take your image, uh, stretch it out, and use those different grayscale values directly as your features. So um, for anybody that sort of worked in this domain, um, we have um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of voxels to work with. Um, and usually in these sorts of problems, only about a few thousand patients. So you've got way more features than you have patients. So this really isn't a good approach for us. <laughs> the other issue is a lot of the information in these images is sort of captured in how the voxels are, or pixels are spatially located. What do their neighbors look like? What are the sort of bigger structures that arise? Um, so we can do better. And the way that we usually do this is we first do some sort of feature extraction step. Um, and the approaches that we take here are sort of ripped straight from the neuroimaging literature. Um, we use the same approaches um, using tools like FreeSurfer, if you're familiar, um, to get sort of anatomical volumes. So looking at the structure of the hippocampus, how big is it, or different um, subcortical structures. Uh, you might also be interested in things like structural morphology. So what does the cortex look like? How big are the grooves? Um, how long are they? How deep are they? That might provide you some interesting information. And if you're looking at those functional images, what's sort of the functional connectivity? How are different regions communicating with each other? 
Then we take those features and we can learn a machine learning model based off of them. Um, and usually if you sort of look in the literature at what's being done, the models that we're using here are actually really straightforward, simple models. We're using things like SVM and Lasso. Um, so we're not getting into those deeper architectures. And again, this sort of loops back to the fact that we really don't have that much data to work with. Um, this data is hard to come by. <laughs> it's hard to run these big studies. So we're really sort of restricted in the complexity of the models that we're able to work with. Um, so there's two approaches that you can sort of take to deal with this. Of course, we'd love to be doing sort of deep learning. Um, so one approach that Canbind has sort of taken and a number of other consortia across um, Canada and the US and Europe is getting bigger data sets. Can we sort of come together as researchers and share our data and get these sort of huge data sets to work with? But of course, these are, that's a challenging task. <laughs> Uh, to get that sort of data, it's expensive and time consuming. Um, and we still usually only end up with a few thousand participants to work with. The other option, which I just want to share with you guys as sort of a closing, is sort of focuses on this idea, the sort of trend of why machine learning has sort of become more popular, and it's the availability of data. Um, we're getting excited about machine learning because there's so much more data available. You know, we have computers, we have our cell phones, we have all these techniques um, that are actively collecting data. So why can't we use that in psychiatry? You know, this, these disorders that have such a strong behavioral manifestation. And that's what one group in the US called MindStrong is doing. Uh, they're doing an approach called digital phenotyping. And the idea is, can we use our cell phones to diagnose and monitor psychiatric disorders? Um, you know, these devices that we carry with us all day long, typing and talking on um, and going with us, there's so much information about all of us. So one of the things they look at is sort of how you interact with your keyboard. So what keystrokes are you making? What buttons are you pressing? Um, are you making a lot of spelling mistakes? Are you using backspace? Can those give us insights into what's going on uh, with your mood? Um, they're also looking at um, analyzing audio recordings, which is something that's become quite popular, sort of thinking about the idea that it's not what you say, but how you're saying it. So is the way that we speak um, providing sort of information about our mental state? And also sensors have become really popular. So um, on both cell phones and also if you wear a Fitbit or any sort of activity monitor, there's a lot of information being captured about how active you are, how much you're sleeping, when you're sleeping, how far away from home you're going. Um, that can be really powerful when it comes to diagnosing and monitoring people with psychiatric disorders. Um, so I guess I kept it short. Thank you so much for listening. Um, hopefully you guys are excited about what's going on in psychiatry. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things going on, so hopefully in the next few years you'll see more about it. And really at the core, we're just working to improve the experience for people dealing with psychiatric disorders. Um, and thank you to all the institutions and funding agencies that make this research possible. It's not, it's not a cheap or easy undertaking, so we really need their support. Thanks.